Welcome, Pat Chun, Athletic Director at Washington State University. Good to have you with us, Pat. Thanks for taking the time. Go Cougs. Yeah, Go <laughs> Cougs is right. Uh, that outlier duck that joined us. I don't know how you got in here. But uh, yeah, Matt, <laughs> put your hands down. Uh, so, Pat, uh, boy, talk about uh, a year that has been something else. But I'm kind of wondering right now, are you feeling some uh, empathy for your colleague at the uh, University of Washington who is, they have stolen the spotlight, I guess, in a not so positive way from uh, WSU. Well, that's a good thing for us. Yeah, empathy, but also, um, I mean, I, I have a ton, Jen Cohen is a friend. Uh, I have a ton of respect for her. Uh, my empathy will wear out because I know she's going to knock this higher out of the park. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> as we go forward, uh, they will be formidable. She will get that program right. No different than we will get ours. And uh, that empathy will turn it once back toward then again, toward um, dislike of our rival because we're going to try to build something that's going to win the Pac-12. I know she's going to build something that's going to try to win the Pac-12 and this thing will be on. So uh, nobody wants to be here really the world i mean the impact you know where we went through it last month just the impact this has on your student athletes and this is not what they sign up for and you don't hire coaches to see them fail i mean you, we hire coaches because we want them to excel and exceed and impact young people and impact the community and washington state it's a very um it's a it's a place that prides itself on family and relationships and we hire coaches that want to be a part of that family and build more relationships so it's it's a very very um it's a very rough place to be when you're the AD, but knowing Jen, I mean, she'll get that, she'll get that higher, right. And, you know, I know, I know what we've done as, as, as we go through our process here and, you know, we got a, you know, right now we're sitting um, with two games left with a lot of, you know, with, 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 with uh, an opportunity to finish this year on the right note, specific, specifically for our seniors. And, you know, we'll go forward in one form or fashion and, um, you know, then on to the 22 season. Yeah. You know, the year has been so difficult. Uh, personally, I know that this has hit you hard in having to deal with the situation because you hired Nick Rolovich. And how, how do you deal with that? Because there is, I think, an emotional aspect of this. You know, there's the business side, obviously, because he's a coach. He, he got a job at the university. But... Um, you know, when you're the guy that makes that decision and it doesn't work out. Well, and I would say, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, we're at that place where we ended up. And I, I would say from the point I sit, the, the seat I sit in and we talk about in our athletic department is, um, you know, accountability has to be our best friend uh, if we're going to do something great. And at, in, in the state of Washington, you know, with, with um, with this, with this vaccination mandate, and it's essentially state law, um, you know, we're all obligated to follow. We all work in higher education. Uh, we all work at one of the great institutions in the country, one of only 12 schools in the Pac-12. It's an honor. It's a privilege. It's not a right by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so as we, as, as for all people in the athletic department, these are, these are sacred opportunities at a school that means a lot uh, more than most, uh, more, more than most, most places do to their alums. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's, you know, when people don't do their jobs, the hard part is you have to hold them accountable. Uh, and in this instance, that's what we did. And, uh, and then the responsibility is no matter what we got to go forward. And, you know, now we're taking those steps. So we're fortunate that Jake Dickert, Dickert in a short period of time has done an incredible job. Um, just, just, you know, piecing this team back together, trying to move us forward. And uh, like I said, we still have a lot on the table for this, the rest of this year. These last two games are huge because they could lead to a bowl game. Uh, that's our expectation here at Washington State. And, um, you know, like anything in life, you can't, you can't change the past. So you just got to keep moving forward. And that's what we're doing here. That's what I'm doing personally as well. Yeah. You know, you know, Pat, in the power five conferences, you're the only Asian American AD, right? Yes. So, and you, you're conducting business in Eastern Washington. And unfortunately, everything is political now. 
I mean, football, everything. And part and parcel of the Rolovich thing was the anti-vaxxer, mass mandate, that whole nonsense. Um, and being in Eastern Washington, how did the, the people, the supporters, just the population that supports WSU, how did they react to all of it? Uh, I mean, did they personally attack you because you're an Asian American? Uh, you know, because that's where it goes every time now. Well, I've had one personal attack, and I think that's <laughs> been well documented. But I mean, even last night, I don't know when you'll record this, but we beat uh, or when you'll play this. But we we had we played UC Santa Barbara, a big basketball game for us. They're a top 100 team, we're a top 60 team, so uh, it's it's a must win game as we aspire to make the NCAA tournament. And I, I think. I think I had five people come up to me last night and mostly, if not all Pullman residents, all kooks that apologized wow, for that's, what that's happened. Great. Yeah. And, and I can't go to, I, I tell you what, I can't go to Safeway. I can't go anywhere with at least one person coming up to me saying, sorry for what happened to you and your family relative to that one person. So um, that in itself is indicative of Pullman in Washington state. Like there are people here that take so much pride in how friendly this community is how caring this community is. And just, it's been really um, heartwarming to see how, um, how offended Pullmanites and Cougs have been for the behavior of one person uh, and their actions. So to me, it's like any, like there's, there's no, I mean, you know, Washington State is a very unique place. I mean, we are more you know, I say this as a compliment, we're more Big Ten or SEC-like relative to our, our loyalty to our institution than than, a PAC, than most Pac-12 schools. I think our alma mater, like, like Washington State and probably Oregon, probably have the two strongest affinity ratings uh, across the board in our league. And uh, by and large, I think people understand here that, um, you know, this place prides itself on, on caring for each other, on having, you know, a very relationship type place. And I think it's been very heartwarming for me and my wife um, just to see how, how, how much this community has rallied behind us relative to that one person. Great. Yeah. yeah. So stepping back for, for a second and looking at college athletics, people don't realize when they start hearing that Rolovich was the highest paid state employee, you know, in excess of $3 million a year, um, that's shocking to people. But the truth is, Collegiate sports is big business. I mean, it's billions of dollars. Um, what's it like having to run? It's basically like a corporation in, in, its, in its endeavors to make money, to make money for the university to support the program. I don't think, how do you describe what goes on now in collegiate athletics? Well, I think you go into this understanding it's a very, very unique business model. <clears throat> And at the end of the day, how we operate, you know, it, it just, and, and what, what athletics does for institutions are very different across different campuses. Now, we are one of the institutions that revi reside in one of these five leagues that um, kind of stand above the rest of college athletics relative to size, scope, and stature. Uh, but when you look at, at your responsibility, I think is where you, where you start from. I mean, at the end of the day, we're stewards of this athletic department. This athletic department started I think when, when our university was founded um, over a century ago, I think three years later, the faculty voted to start baseball year. So think about it for over a century, sports has been woven into the fabric of Washington State University for no other reason than it's important. And then you fast forward where we are today and uh, these Saturdays that we have on our campus relative to football are sacred. Uh, because we have generations of families that come back. We have grandparents that take their grandkids uh, to Washington State games because it's important. So I think you understand that it, it's a unique business model because two sports generate all the revenue for us for the longest time. It's been one sport with football. We made changes in men's basketball, so hopefully we can get to two sports that generate revenue. It provides opportunities for you know 400 other student athletes on our campus. Um, you know, men, women, different races, genders, uh, backgrounds, ethnicities, and it parked, it, it, it really is one of the main fuels of what makes Washington State so great and so strong. So, um, you know, college sports is accelerating into a very different place. It's, 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 it's uh, grip on 
on society is probably bigger than it's ever been. Uh, but I think when you look at it through that lens, I don't, I don't know if we in our athletic department look at it in terms of, yeah, we understand how big it's getting, but I think it also, we also take ownership of the responsibility we have um, to make sure that we're representing Washington State so correctly. And uh, I think that's what's hurt though, over the last year and a half or last year is, is, you know, we've made the news for things that we shouldn't be making the news for. We should be making the news for um, the great things our student athletes are doing. And that opens the door to talk about the great things the rest of this institution is doing. And uh, you guys see it, you know, being in this state, you know, the, 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 the brand of Washington State has probably never been stronger. And you see the reach and impact uh, Washington State has in the state of Washington and the region globally, what our alums are doing, not only in the state region, but globally. I mean, this is a pretty wonderful time to be a Coug at Washington State. And one thing that is kind of a central theme is you turn on ESPN game day Saturday morning, you see some alum waving that flag for whatever consecutive number of Saturdays because that's just what Washington State does. And you come to one of these football games on a Saturday and you got generations of fans and new students and students that are here to celebrate what it means to be a Cougar at Washington state. Yeah. You know, Matt, uh, you don't see an Oregon flag at those, uh, Oh, you don't. Things. I think it's because of the, the ducks just can't get up that early in the morning to do it. So anyway, <laughs> half the time. Um, yeah, I got to get the digs in here. So, Pat, it's uh, the only way it's the only way Wazoo gets shown on national TV. Yeah, right. Yeah, Because <laughs> we outwork everybody. You're there you right. go. There <laughs> you go. Yeah. The work ethic. You're right. So since the Rolovich situation has happened and, and, you know, he's appealing his termination and, you know, there's so much uh, with that. Um, I won't go into details about that because we could, we could spend uh, several hours. Um, But there's been actually this positive reaction, particularly from, from a fundraising standpoint. Is that surprising? Not surprising because I, I think when people look at adversity from an external standpoint, they kind of look at, you know, wh- whoever's left standing is left on an island. Uh, Enrique, you know, you're a part of this um, at Washington State. All that really does is bring people closer together because Washington State has always had this mindset that it's us, only yeah. us. If you're not with us, well, basically you're against us and we're going to band together to make sure that we survive this. So I think anything like we've done, I think right away within that first week, we got over three and a half million in new gift commitments. I think over the last month, we've, you know, we're probably over $7 million in new gift commitments and really more, more, more great news on the way. But when you look back, that's really just who Washington state is. They see their university is, is, um, you know, stuck at a point where um, there's a lot of adversity. And, and I think our coups understand that, hey, um, we are going to make loud statements to show how much we love and care about the university and how the university is gonna to continue to go forward. Uh, when most places may be reeling, coups wanna make sure that, hey, um, this university was built on the shoulders of so many. And we got a bunch of alums right now that what will continue to put this university on their shoulders and push us forward because they know how important Washington state is to the state of Washington. And um, it's just one of those amazing things that makes Washington state. So, so wonderful is, is really the great news in terms of fundraising that we've had, you know, since November 19th or excuse me, October 19th. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, how did what you grew up in Ohio, right? Yes. Okay. So, where did your interest develop so that you wanted a career and and a goal to be an athletic director, or is that something that you actually planned on doing? No, that didn't start till late. But but you know, I'm I'm the son of immigrants, so my parents came here from South Korea. They came in nineteen. My dad came in nineteen sixty nine. My mom came in nineteen seventy. And a lot like like many immigrants that came over that time, you know, they came with a belief in this thing they called the American dream. And my parents really figured they had two, there were two ways that they were going to achieve it. And I think so those of us who are children of immigrants understand that their dreams actually manifest themselves through their children, not through themselves. And their tools were going to be through work ethic and education. 
So that was branded in me before I was even born that uh, you're going to have a work ethic and that's what both my parents had and have, and you are gonna go get an education because that is, uh, and to this day, and I tell everyone it's, undeba- it's, it's not even debatable in this country. If you want your best chance of changing your socioeconomic status in this country, it is going to be through education. It's not going to be through hitting the lottery. So that was planted in me throughout my entire life. My dad came here. He was a Taekwondo instructor. So in a very Korean way, I was kind of the son of a coach uh, because that's what, that was his craft. And my mom, I mean, she's in her late seventies right now. She's still working in our neighborhood grocery store. Um, she's not going to stop working until they tell her to stop working. Cause that's all she knows. <laughs> uh, and she's that lady. And, and yeah, so that, that is instilled in me and I grew up in Cleveland. So you have this great love of sports. Uh, when you grow up in the eighties, you don't really experience winning. You just love the sports side of it. And, <laughs> so uh, perfect to be at WSU. <laughs> yeah. Got a lot of winning. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> got a lot of winning. So, um, so, but I, so I grew, I, I grew up just in that environment. Well, always wanted to play college sports, wasn't good enough, wanted to go to the big flagship state institution, uh, land grant institution, my home state, which is what Washington State is here and did that and got my foot in the door in the athletic department there my senior year. And um, that really changed my life because it, you, you're, you're always a product of the environment you're in and to be in that athletic department for 15 years. Uh, to be surrounded by great mentors and coaches and friends and, you know, high performing people. And, uh, you know, that just really shaped me and it really gave me a, a deep understanding of the impact of people, relationships, leadership, management, um, all those key things that, that, that allow organizations to move forward. And, uh, and that brought me ultimately to Washington State. You know, that's interesting because, you know, I mean, I didn't take a traditional route either. I mean, I'm in entertainment, you know. I mean, Asian parents want you to be a doctor, a lawyer, a pharmacist <laughs> and stuff. I mean, how did your parents react? I mean, obviously, you know, you're very successful now, but your route up, what did they look? Did they did they understand what you were doing? No, I remember when I left <laughs> Ohio State, like my mom, it, it was foreign to my mom to leave a job. Like I said, yes, she's been yes. at the same place since since I've been in grade school. So um, when I left Ohio State, she actually pulled me aside and said, "Did you get fired?" Uh, <laughs> for my first job. And, and, and and you guys will appreciate this. So uh, so I so Washington State has this extraordinary history with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Like we are a pioneer in Title IX. We had the first black uh, head coach of any high profile sport, George Raveling in the Pac-12. You know, this is just a place that. Um, that has always acted on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some people talk about it. Washington State is just in their DNA. So for Kirk Schultz to hire me, I, pr- I tell everyone, I don't. I, I promise you, race didn't come into play because Kirk was looking for someone with my background, and that's how I ended up here. And you, lo and behold, you come here and you understand that's Washington State. They always, you know, they value diversity, equity, and inclusion. So when I took this job, it actually made more news probably than I ever imagined because it broke a seal, a glass ceiling in college athletics with an Asian American being at a power five school. So uh, the Washington Post wrote this nice story. Uh, one of the Korean newspapers picked it up. It got to my mom's church and my mom called me and told me how proud she was of me that I was an AD. And I had to tell her, hey, mom, you know, I've been an AD for five years. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't just happen at Washington yeah. State. But to your point, it's, it's and with Asian parents or Korean parents, in my case, um, you know, they, they uh, the fact that I didn't go to Yale or Harvard, I went to Ohio State and I'm not a doctor or a lawyer. It, it, it's uh, I'm a late bloomer in her eyes. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're glad that you're a late bloomer. Uh, so <laughs> what what does that mean to you? Um, well, I, I, it, it's, it's, so, well, I think there's a, there's a, it, it's a layered, it's layered because one, I, I, I fully understand the responsibility I have and the only failure for me relative to being the only would be if I'm the last. So I know me, there's not a lot of us in college athletics, but we are working together. We started a, uh, a group called four AAPI last, uh, last May in and around, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Awareness Month. Uh, there's a really good handful of highly successful, highly qualified Asian American uh, administrators in college athletics that I know like when me and the Yale AD and the former commissioner of the America East were kind of like the three that um, have kind of made our way without having role models or mentors that look like us. Although we have plenty of role models and mentors, we recognize the value we can have for this next generation of athletic administrators coming up. So that's one piece of it. The second thing is, um, 
you know, it, being in this era of social justice and how these these topics are now at the forefront and having a high school age daughter and a middle middle school age daughter just to be able to have these conversations with them uh, and for to have two daughters. Like when I grew up in the 80s, I, I was like my parents struggled with the language. So they were so focused on fitting in and assimilating. Uh, that was my, that was, you know, it, like you didn't want to stick out. You didn't want to, you know, you, you kind of ran a little bit. Like when my friends came over, you know, it's like, you're like, your party is embarrassed that we have rice cooking in the house all the time. You know, <laughs> with, with my, with my daughters, they, they embrace it yeah. and they love being Korean American and they love their heritage and they love talking to their grandmother about who they are and where they came from and eating the food and, calling me a sellout because I don't love the food as much as they do. <laughs> so I think awesome. it's, <laughs> so it, 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 it's layered because you see how the world's changed really for the most part for the positive. You understand that just through fate, you have like this weird spot in sports that, um, you know, gives you a platform that you have a responsibility to use. And I get to see the impact that has on, on my three girls at home. Um, which I know they take a lot of pride in. And uh, for those who know me, I mean, my, my um, you know, I, I'm a pretty simple person relative to what motivates me, drives me. And that's my wife and kids for the most part, uh, but they're really the main part as well. And so I think it, 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 that, it, it just, it's different. I know it means a lot to my mom, uh, but at the end of the day, it, it's a big responsibility that I, that I own. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, and I worked at a place for 15 years that embraced diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I was promoted, I think, six times in 15 years at Ohio State. My background, like who I look like, never came into play. It was always about performance. So I think I like it like anything in life. You know, I pride myself in my work ethic, but I also am blessed that um, there's an element of luck in what I've had to go through relative to the people I've been fortunate to call mentors and advisors. You know, there's an element of luck that you end up at a place like Washington State and you work. You know, for those who don't know, Kirk Schultz's reputation when you, you know, in college athletics is the best president to work for because he just has a profound understanding of the way, the way athletics impacts campuses. And then I tell people, once you start working for Kirk, uh, you take this job because you know you're going to work for a great president. I tell people he actually exceeds that hype because he's even better than what people think he is. So yeah. there, there is a huge element of luck when, when you talk about, you know, careers and success. Um, and and I'm, I'm just fortunate that I've been the recipient of that luck. Yeah. Do you think do you think in the pipeline there's going to be more Asian American football players, you know, like specifically quarterbacks? I mean, there is one Asian American quarterback, Kyler Murray. He's part Korean American. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I don't I think, think a lot of people know that. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that's the world, true. The, yeah. The world, the world's going to keep changing. You know, the defensive coordinator at Notre Dame, Marcus Freeman, who was at Ohio, was a student athlete when I was at Ohio State. He's half Korean, half African American. So I think the world's changing where there's going to be, you know, hopefully, you know, the, the, you know, I think that's where it's how all the social justice issues that have come to the forefront, I think, are healthy as the country works through those things. But I think you're right. As the world continues to evolve and what, what we looked at yesterday as mixed kids is just basically normal kids and how yeah. they how they perform and how they do things. And, you know, to have rep that representation does matter. I mean, I remember being a little kid and actually believing that I couldn't play pro sports because there was no representation. And that that word belief is so critical. It's like I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see where my girls end up in life because they've grown up in college sports. So all they've seen since they've been little kids are these high performing, hard charging, <laughs> yeah. overly athletic women that compete at the highest levels that, you know, I, I like there, there is no, if you're in Pullman, I tell one, there's no better place if you got young daughters than to take them to one of our soccer games. Because mm -hmm. our soccer team is, they will beat you in soccer. And if it turns into a fist fight on the soccer field, they'll beat you in that <laughs> fist fight. And it is pretty cool to watch when you see daughters, when you have daughters at home and you see a bunch of women come together as a team, uh, play at a high level. They were in the college couple a couple of years ago. They're in the tournament right now. Uh, and just just have each other's backs and, um, you know, don't take crap from anybody. They are their team GPA is above a 3.0. I mean, that's the environment my girls have grown up in. And it's it's pretty cool to see that they have tons of representation, tons of, you know, whether it's women, Asian American women uh, that they can look up to to see that are doing things at high levels. Yeah, that's great. Um, you mentioned that your father, uh, he was a Taekwondo instructor. Yes. 
How about you? Tenth degree black dot. So he <laughs> he passed away a few years ago. So, uh-huh. so this is this is a challenge for my daughters when they when we were going through the, all the social justice stuff. They wanted me to put my black belt in my office to show them. Oh, that, uh, look at for, that! Uh, so oh. I leave that in my office now. All my wow. Tuck it in the corner so that uh, uh, no one sees it. But that is actually a what I call a courtesy black belt, kind of like a. <laughs> I think that my dad just gave that to me just because I would have been the only male, I think, in a whole family lineage that didn't have one. So I don't have to pass that on to my daughters. My youngest may get into it um, because she's she's 11 and we always mess around uh, at home with, with martial arts, just screw around. Uh, but that, that's, that's the extent of my martial arts. If there's a fight, I'm running. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I'd be running, <laughs> especially where I grew up. That's, a, that's how I actually got fast, was <laughs> running up. Um, Pat, so as you look at the, the situation now in, in college sports, and uh, as Matt noted, it's, it's become big business uh, and, and the changes in it. What are you seeing in the players now that, that come to school or now they have the uh, what is it? The name image likeness opportunity where and I know that at, at Washington State, you put together a, a pretty good program to educate them about that, uh, which I was very impressed with. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, I think college kids as a whole have more information at their fingertips. They're smarter. There's also probably like an artificial maturity college students have because they have so much information at their fingertips, everything, every, you know, you know, when, when I was growing up, you'd have to look stuff up in an encyclopedia. <laughs> now we could be sitting up at a game and, you know, we could Google something to, to figure out what the answer is going to be. So, um, and I think the world's changed where I think most modernized athletic departments and we pride ourselves in being one of those, um, you know, we know we have to adapt to the needs of a very broad group of student athletes. And at Washington State, we recruit them from all corners of the state and all corners of the world. So, um, and times are changing. I think, you know, mental health is a key component in terms of how we, uh, how we um, bring out the best in our student athletes and address those types of things. So college sports is changing at a very rapid pace. I think our student athletes, uh, to their credit, are more knowledgeable, more empowered than they've ever been. Um, but they should be, this is their experience. We all have had, you know, everyone only has four or maybe five years of college. Uh, they are critical in your development as a human being. You know, when you come to a place like Washington state, the hope is we surround you, but with this extraordinary environment filled with great friends and great coaches and, uh, a great school and a great educational experience that allows you to be the best you can be. So college athletics is changing, but I think it's just a reflection of young people are changing. And with name, image, and likeness, with all the mental health uh, um, uh, advocacy that needs to happen, uh, with the way kids are learning is very different because we got to generate, we got this next iteration of, of, of college students will have spent, what, a year and a half uh, out of classrooms on Zoom. In- Zoom. Uh, so just even how they consume their education is very different. And it's up to us and on, on this side of the fence, on the education side, to uh, to be able to figure out a ways to adapt so they can figure out how to be the best they're supposed to be. But you've actually <laughs> paired them with the uh, Carson School of Business Education over there to uh, yeah, come up for come NIL. Up with, yeah. Yeah. It may be a Washington State thing, but but, you know, we were tasked with, all right, you know, we don't have the budget to go hire, you know, X number of companies to help educate us. But wow, we sit on this college campus where there's extraordinary expertise in all these areas. And you know, I think it was literally one phone call to Marie Mays over at the college, Carson College of Business. And uh, she said, all right, we think we can help you with this. And she put together one run, one credit course for us, which I think is kind of now kind of a, a national benchmark on how to uh, integrate with campus, partner with campus. I think we have some bold plans with that class and how to expand it. But it's it's really I, I, it's tough one. It's really indicative of where Washington State University is in 2021. Is um, you know I, you know we're an athletic department. We're never going to out resource anybody. Uh, we're never going to out resource Matt's alma mater. Uh, but we can out people anyone's alma mater at the end of the day. And uh, that's our greatest strength here at Washington State. And when you see how we just came to this pretty innovative solution with educating our student athletes on NIL, that you actually have experts now on campus. I mean, could you argue with, uh, you know, the staff, faculty and staff we have in Murrow or the Carson College to help educate our student athletes on being their own business? 
mean, you're not going to get a better, you're not going to get better expertise anywhere in the world, let alone uh, coming up with a third party to, to educate, to pay them to educate student athletes on this. Yeah. Great connections you know, there for them too. It, it's interesting that since you're, your tenure there, you have had more action than most ADs have in their entire career. I mean, you had to deal with tragic mental health issues there, you know, uh, the pandemic, social equity issues, and then, you know, the, uh, then the firing of the coaches. Um, and when do you think it's going to settle down for you there? <laughs> Well, I think the the wonderful thing, like adversity is just a part of it and it's how you react. Like, like it's the old adage, life is, you know, um, whatever, 10% what happens, 90% how you react to it. And, you know, at Washington State, it's, it's, a, it's a very, um, it, it's a place that everyone takes ownership of the institution. So no matter what adversity we've had here, let alone anywhere on the campus, you know, we don't, you know, Kirk, you know, our president doesn't look at it like it's your problem. You know, he looks at it and say, all right, we'll work together to find a solution. Our regents, they don't look at, you know, what's going on here and say that's, you know, the AD's problem. It's all right, let's figure out a way to support because we trust what they're doing and we believe in, uh, you know, our process and how we handle things and let's make sure we get to the right solution. So I think it's, it's really like every organization goes through this, this type of stuff. I think we're just in a unique time in Washington State history. <laughs> why, it's why we've been able, I tell everyone, we've overperformed in fundraising. We got our, we got in the pandemic, we got GISA Credit Union to partner with naming our field. Our teams are performing. Our graduation rates are the highest it's ever been. Our academic GPA is the highest it's ever been. Uh, you know, our ticket sales are where they were at pre-pandemic. Um, you know, we're winning really in all of our sports across the board right now. Even, you know, even, even football has a chance to go to a bowl. I mean, this could be like, we looked at this year as one of those years. So, I mean, it's really indicative of just how much care and how much love has gone into this athletic program and people at the highest, highest levels of this institution understand the importance of, 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 a, of, a, of a high achieving um, athletic department. We, we are not a place that's ever going to apologize for wanting to win. I mean, that's part of being at Washington State. Like, we will take whatever the challenges are, we'll take them, we'll own them, and then we'll go figure out a way to win with them. And I think that's probably what makes Washington State so special. I have to say that I've been very impressed with the way that the players on this football team uh, in the aftermath of uh, the Rolovich situation and the way Jake Dickert, who is the uh, defensive coordinator that stepped up now to be the interim coach, um, the way he's handled it all too. Uh, there's a sense of positiveness and energy there that um, has really been, uh, it's, it's just been something to watch. And, and they have not, you know, it's not like they tanked anything because they, they, that's not the case at all. If anything, they've really stepped up. And character is revealed. And these are the moments where we saw, we see a, a high character group of young men and a high character group of coaches that remain that, um, that are vigilant about being the best they're supposed to be and working toward that in spite of whatever's thrown in front of them. And it's been pretty inspiring to watch. Yeah, it's been very inspiring to watch. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, <laughs> we'll uh, pick up our next two wins here. You know, well, the so, most important win is the Apple Cup. Right? There you go. That would be nice. <laughs> All right. All right. Pat, Sean, uh, thank you for taking the time to, to talk with us. And um, well, let's let's hope that things keep going and uh, that uh, the progress here at the university fundraising and also uh, in the win column continues as well. Thanks for taking the time, Pat. I really appreciate it. Go Cougs. Thank you, guys. Go All Cougs. Right. Go Cougs. Hey, nice, Pat. Nice. I sounded so <laughs> eloquent coming out of your lips. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right.